Okay, we've looked at some uh, market trends uh, and we've focused on the problem of the long order book in a situation like this and the fact that there is a big time lag. This is uh, uh, the reason for the extreme volatility in the business that uh, it takes very long time to adjust to a new situation. And if you look at the order books, meaning the how many vessels or the value in this case of the vessels that's been ordered, you can see that Norway is on the top of investors here. But that's mainly driven by the offshore uh, investments. Um, and you can see that this, um, this is a slightly different picture than, than the ownership scale. Here are the existing orders from different countries. And you can see that China is a big investor in the bulk capacity, uh, as is Japan. Or, sorry, this is by builders. So these are the shipbuilding nations of the world. Uh, and it's by dead weight tonnage, so it means that the big bulk vessels, which are mainly produced in these three countries, are dominating the market. The uh, offshore supply vessels produced in this area would be in the other category, and, and that's uh, almost what is left in Europe. This is one of the main drivers behind uh, the tanker market, the energy consumption uh, the type and quite a lot of people would think that coal is actually a thing of the past but look at China here the energy consumption of China very much dominated by coal um, also quite important in the US and it's actually coal that has the fastest growth rate of uh, the energy sources uh, you can see that nuclear has now uh, a flat development. Uh, hydroelectric power, which is the dominating source in, in Norway, is slightly on the upswing. But it's really the coal bit which is uh, increasing in volume, driven partly by uh, new power plants in, in China. The world's steel production is very much dominated by China. The red curve here. And dry bulk shipments then is also dominated by these three categories, iron ore and coal, following more or less the same development pattern. Um, when it comes to gas, liquid natural gas, uh, Qatar from the Middle East is uh, the major exporter and then a number of other nations also parts of this market. Um, LNG has been an alternative especially for the Japanese power production after they've shut down nuclear power plants. The, um, the latest development of the US shale gas uh, exploration has uh, changed the market very much. So uh, whereas this looked at a very lucrative market from an exporter's point of view a few years ago, this has now um, been heavily influenced by new sources uh, in the US. And the Stockman gas field is uh, the Russian planned uh, field uh, up in the Barents Sea. Uh, and this has been put on hold because of the current market uh, developments. Uh, and other factors. Jumping from one um, bit of the shipping sector to a, an entirely different one, this is a, a picture from one of the major scrap yards of the world. They are basically um, located uh, in uh, countries like India, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and the, uh, it's a very low-tech type of operation. They run the ships on the shore uh, on high tide and then it's a lot of manual work in dismantling the vessels and the steel and other materials is then used for local industries but this is a very controversial business with a lot of safety concerns uh, 
uh, with a lot of uh, injuries and fatalities, uh, workers dying and, or being subjected to um, poisonous materials. This is then the market for demolition or scrapping. Uh, and as you can see, it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which is the dominating actor. But China is also engaging a little bit in, in this. This then, I've mentioned the Northern Sea Route as uh, one of the potential big changes in, in uh, shipping. Um, this is a slightly odd perspective on, uh, on uh, the global map, but it illustrates two Atlantic routes. Uh, this is the, the one passing from northern Norway along the Russian coast uh, and to Asia this way. It's called the Northern Sea Route. The alternative is the Northwest Passage, which is going between Greenland and northern Canada uh, and this way. Both of these routes would significantly change the world transports if uh, it happens. The reason why uh, there's talk about them is that uh, the ice cap of the North Pole is uh, shrinking quite heavily. And um, uh, now we've seen the first shipments going through here. I think last year some 40 vessels passed through the North, um, Northern Sea Route uh, here. So maybe in a few years this will replace part of the traffic now going through the Suez Canal. And it would save typically some 10 days of sailing time. Typically the Asia-Europe route today would take some 30 days. But one third of that could be saved by going on this shortcut. This has been a, both a major concern and also a major opportunity for northern Norwegian ports, for instance, which hope to gain some, some business from this. Um, but it's also a concern because uh, it poses some environmental challenges with all this ship traffic passing through northern Norway, for instance. There's still some time to go before the ice is uh, gone, but uh, so this illustrates the current state of affairs. So summing up the market developments then, the volatility of the shipping market is much higher than, for instance, the stock market, meaning that the changes are more dramatic uh, in the shipping market. And the reason for that is the sluggishness of the supply side. It means it takes time to adjust capacity um, in the shipping business and also the long lead times from order to delivery of new tonnage is one of the main factors. It means that when things go bad like it did in 2008, it can even go worse because of new tonnage entering uh, already uh, uh, bad market situation. So the credit crunch or, or whatever you call it in you know, 2008 hit most shipping markets very hard and the recovery seems to be very slow. Most of the markets have not recovered um, since then. In the container market we've seen that the initiatives are taken for further market consolidation, meaning higher concentration uh, and this P3 alliance which has been suggested would mean that uh, the, the, the biggest constellation would control some 30% of the world market, which uh, could become uh, problematic. Question is, will it be accepted by authorities in the US or the EU? That remains to be seen. Okay, last bit of this lecture is related to international shipping policies. Um, the key challenge here is to regulate a truly globalized industry. Uh, we would need international regulations and agreement, agreements to, to control this industry. And uh, there is also a need for international cooperation. We will look at a few of the key players uh, here on the international shipping policy arena. Of course, the ship owners and their organizations are important, but also the port states they have gained in importance. The flag states, meaning where the ship is registered, 
and then something called the classification societies. These classification societies are the quality assurers of shipping. Uh, in Norway we have something called the Norske Veritas, which is now, has just recently merged with the German one, Germanisch Lloyd. Uh, and they've become the biggest of the world uh, now. But there are some 10 or 11 uh, big classification societies in the world. Shipping used to be international, but has become truly global. Um, and this is also part of uh, the globalization. Uh, probably you could say that shipping was the first truly globalized uh, uh, industry. Now, the alternative to global regulation would be national or multinational regulations. And why would we want global regulations rather than national ones or international ones? Why would we want regulations to be global? Couldn't we propose this as a Brazilian or Norwegian or German? Exactly, that's, that's one of the two major reasons. One uh, is the, the fact that it's easy to evade, to escape from the regulations if you don't make them global. Then you can just shift the, 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 the registration of uh, the ship. But from a ship owner's point of view, it might also be better with a global regulation rather than a regional or national one. What could that be about? One of, one of the regulations that we could talk about here is uh, what I think we mentioned briefly, is that we had a few years ago a, a new regulation which was about the double hulling of, of uh, tanker vessels, saying that you need to have a double hull in order to prevent uh, leakages from uh, uh, and in the, if you sort of harm the uh, uh, outer hull, you will not have an oil leakage. A few years ago, this was introduced as a new global regulation. From a ship owner's point of view, if this legislation was, also, was only implemented in Europe and not the rest of the world, why could that be a problem? Yes, it, it would limit the flexibility of the ship from a ship owner's point of view. They will only be able to use certain vessels for European trades and other vessels for others. So it could also be uh, a less cost efficient way of regulating shipping. So um, the national or regional solutions could be both ineffective and inefficient. One could expect, uh, escape from them, they could be evaded, uh, and it could cause inefficiencies. So global standards are needed, and the, way, the reason why we need to regulate things is that we don't want a race to the bottom. If you have free and open competition, it would pay for a ship owner to have a very cheap operation, and maybe that would mean that you would accept uh, very rusty old vessels, which uh, uh, represent both um, a problem and a hazard to the sailors. Maybe they would risk their lives there. Or it could be also a risk to the nations that these vessels will break into and, uh, and uh, create pollutions. So a truly globalized industry would require global regulations of some sort. Now, just briefly introducing the, the regulatory framework and their institutions. Some of the ones institutions we've mentioned already. The World Trade Organization uh, regulates market access and tries to promote free trade. Um, uh, United Nations uh, uh, Conference on Trade and Development uh, is another actor. 
when it comes to safety, security and environmental issues, it's the UN and the UN body for maritime affairs, International Maritime Organization, which is the key organization. And then you have the International Labour Organization, which uh, engages in, in working conditions and labour rights. Um, Competition policy, we just briefly mentioned that uh, the EU might uh, uh, oppose to this new P3 alliance. The same goes for the American one, for instance. But um, this is also an important area. Now, flags of convenience or open registries has al already been mentioned here. Um, the um, uh, Panamanian flag is one of these open registries. Open means that it, you don't have to be a citizen of the country in order to register your vessel there. So there are no nationality requirements of crewing in these uh, registries, whereas if you are flying the traditional Norwegian uh, flag, you will have to have Norwegian uh, sailors uh, manning the vessel. There could be a very low taxing environment and uh, the company legislation might be fairly liberal. So here are some of the big open registries and um, they uh, could be controversial um, but uh, the way they've acted they have created a global capital and labor market for shipping. Um, the workers federation is critical against uh, these open registries because uh, they claim that they put the downwards pressure on wages and it could, they could have poorer onboard conditions uh, and a number of lists. So this is taken from the ITF uh, web page, uh, a publication called uh, The Black Sea of Shame, which is uh, about uh, problems that they think pertain to uh, flags of convenience. Now, um, market access, it's mainly, the main picture is that all operators are allowed to, to uh, offer their services in most waters. Uh, very few restrictions left to, to um, market access. Um, there are a few bilateral cargo restri restrictions left in, in liner trades, but most nations or areas will have special arrangements when it comes to government cargo, strategic cargo, military uh, type of um, uh, transport, and uh, this which is called cabotage, which we have mentioned briefly before. And as I said to some of the students in the break, during the break, uh, one of the um, big exemptions from the free market access is what's called the Jones Act. Uh, or officially it's called the Merchant Marine Act. And uh, it was triggered by uh, the situation in the US and during the First World War, where they discovered that they didn't have enough uh, vessels uh, under American control to, uh, to supply the country with vital cargo. So they created this Jones Act which uh, says that all coastal trade in the US uh, should be carried out by vessels that are owned by a US citizen, manned by a US crew, built in the US, managed there and the vessel needs to be registered there. All government cargoes are reserved for US flag. Alaskan oil is also reserved for US flag. Now, I mentioned that the UN works through IMO in developing new regulations. Uh, this is the way a new regulation enters into force. First, there is a new proposal for regulation. Let's say that um, the Norwegian government wants to uh, have a new regulation of CO2 emissions in shipping. Then this could uh, come as a proposition to the IMO and the IMO will then establish a special committee or a subcommittee under one of the main committees 
for handling this. Then typically they would call for a conference or several conferences discussing the issue. Um, and then when they have agreed upon a new convention or a new regulation, it uh, needs a number of underwriting uh, countries um, which represents at least half of the world tonnage in order to become effective. It takes a lot of time normally uh, to adopt and, and ratify conventions. And by ratifying them, it means that it needs to be included in the national legislation as well. The typical conflict lines would be between states with a strong environmental and safety um, uh, concern. Uh, and typically the dividing line could also go by industrialized countries, richer countries against poorer. Um, yeah. This is uh, a typical way of new, which new regulations also follow. Uh, you will have some sort of an accident or an incident, something happening, and then there is an investigation which, uh, why did this happen? This could trigger an ID for a new regulation, a new technology, something that we want to uh, implement. And then it comes as a proposal to the IMO. Um, this um, is then entering into some sort of a discussion and conferences. And then uh, a draft regulation is circulated. And uh, this is hopefully then adopted. In some cases, um, it's not adopted at all. There are numerous proposals which never reaches uh, enough agreement to, to come into force. One of the major conventions uh, on the environment is the MARPOL Convention. MARPOL stands for Marine Pollution. And uh, it's a regulation to minimize risk of uh, uh, pollution or minimize pollution in general. One of it, uh, of the parts is accidental pollution and the phasing out of single hull tankers, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. This uh, regulation regulates the operational discharges of oil and chemicals and substances, sewage and garbage. Uh, but then the latest developments is not focused. These are emissions to sea whereas the latest additions to the regulation focuses on emissions to air. Um, this uh, is called the Annex 6, and uh, it came, the first regulations came in force, uh, into force in 2005, uh, and it's, it's dealing with sulfur and nitrogen oxides and, and some other substances. This is the current regulatory regime here, Sulfur content of fuels is, uh, is one important area um, where the initial global cap was put on uh, at 4.5% sulfur. This was not very effic effective because the average sulfur content of fuels were some 2.7%. Then a new construction, some uh, um, special uh, areas um, were designated for a stricter regulation. And the first ones were the Baltic Sea, the North Sea and the English Channel, and eventually also North, and, um, ah, it's, it says North, uh, it should be East and West uh, uh, part of North America here. Stricter limits were introduced in 2010, uh, and now uh, this is, uh, going to be even stricter in a couple of years time and this is a major concern for the shipping business at the moment here. Um, the emissions of NOx is uh, treated in a different way. This is about the fuel qualities but this is about the engine technology and now uh, newer engines has to uh, emit less NOx. This is then a map of these environmental control areas, as I mentioned. Uh, the first bit was the Baltic and the North Sea. Uh, the Norwegian Sea may be added to it. Uh, the Mediterranean may be added in the future. 
and uh, also the east and west coast of North America has been has entered as stricter uh, an area of stricter regulations. And this is the implementation for uh, the sulfur content. As can be seen, this was the first global regulation. Then the special areas like the Baltic and the North Sea had stricter regulations in, in two steps already. In, in two years, it would be even stricter. The EU has added some regulations of its own for EU ports, which is represented by this red line. Um, NOx, as I said, is uh, related to the engine generations and uh, is treated in a, in a different way. Now, some remaining challenges when it comes to environmental regulations. Discharging of ballast water. A vessel that doesn't contain cargo has to have ballast water in order to keep stable. And this ballast water is uh, discharged when they are loading new cargo. Do you have any idea why this could be an environmental challenge, environmental problem? Just discharging ballast water. Yes? Um, the water comes from different seas, so there might be different bacteria in it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the water, if it's been on the, in the ship for a long time, it goes still, and it can grow hmm. more bacteria. Yeah. Not only bacteria, but uh, microorganisms in, ge in general. You introduce foreign species, you take water from one part of the world and discharge it in another part of the world, then you can do something to um, the, uh, uh, the harmful things to, to the local um, biology. So this has been an issue for some years. And there are um, different technical solutions to this. Uh, where uh, you could treat the water uh, in order to, to kill some of the substances in it. Another one is to ban uh, some toxic uh, paint used on the vessels. Um, uh, this should have been updated. Uh, regulation of CO2 emissions. The emissions of CO2 from shipping is not included in the current um, regulations and there's been a number of propositions to, to include this in the regulatory regime. Uh, the EU is a bit impatient with this. They threaten originally to have a regulation of their own by 2012. It just didn't happen then. It might still happen. And now we will have more ambitious sulfur and anox uh, um, uh, regulations as mentioned. Ship recycling is still uh, something that needs to be uh, uh, regulated better. And also problems with wrecks that uh, have capsized and, uh, and which is left there by the owners and uh, which is very costly to uh, deal with. I had one picture of the recycling uh, a few minutes ago. This is uh, another one from uh, one of these beaches. And, uh, this picture illustrates one of the toxic uh, um, materials like asbestos used for insulations in old vessels, which is, uh, is very harmful and can cause cancer. Now, switching from the environment to safety, another regulation is the solar safety of lives at sea. Um, which uh, sets standards for uh, how the vessel should be uh, uh, and with respect to construction and equipment and operation and uh, what the responsibilities of the flag states are and requirements on when they need to check the quality of the vessel. And uh, in this part of the regulatory regime, there's been a change from the vessel and the technical requirements to more focus on the human factor. Uh, statistics tells us that uh, 8 out of 10 accidents are caused by some sort of human error and therefore the focus has now been more on the qualifications of the sailors and, uh, and the quality assurance systems on board. Uh, 
Okay. Part of um, the safety regime uh, is uh, the ISM code. Uh, they, this requires the safety management system to be established uh, by all operators, which ensures that they comply with all regulations and report uh, accidents and, and incidents. Uh, they should have uh, goals and principles for uh, improvement and there should be one person responsible for the safety of the vessel. Uh, part of this was triggered by the piracy uh, action against the USS Cole, the military vessel, in, uh, uh, back in, uh, in 2011. Piracy is still a problem of the world. Um, this is, uh, these are some pictures from the, the Bay of Aden uh, outside Somalia uh, at the entrance uh, of uh, the uh, passage to the Suez Canal. Um, pirates have entered and taken hostage, hostage a lot of vessels and, and crew members and, uh, and the ship owners have to pay ransoms which makes this uh, a highly profitable business for some of the pirates. Latest statistics shows that the problem is now declining in this area. It's not gone and it's still active in many areas of the world. Uh, partly this is due to an international force of uh, marine vessels trying to police the area, but it's also uh, probably due to the fact that many uh, ship owners now have armed their vessels and uh, hired security personnel uh, on board. Another safety regulation sorry, uh, is the STCW convention which uh, focuses on the qualifications of the seafarers and what kind of training they will have as a minimum. I mentioned this double hauling case. This is quite interesting because it also uh, tells the story of the balance between regional initiatives and global initiatives. Back in 1989, we had one of the worst um, pollution accidents happening in Alaska. Uh, a vessel called Exxon Valdez um, created a huge oil spill in a very sensitive area. Um, this triggered a new strict regulation in the US the year after, called the Oil Pollution Act, or OPA 90, uh, which said that all new oil tankers need to have double hulls. Uh, and they had sort of a phased approach and say that single hull tankers should be out of the market by 2015. This was then just the US regulation, a national regulation. But it was proposed as part of the international regulations, the MARPOL uh, Convention. Um, then we had two European accidents in the years after, or actually 10 years after. Uh, the Erika accident outside France and the Prestige uh, accident in, also in southern Europe. Uh, and these created a lot of political pressure in the European side of, of things. And this meant that the European politicians said that we need to do something about this and put emphasis on the processes in the IMO to also um, implement the double hauling uh, scheme and to speed up the substitution of uh, uh, single hull uh, tankers. Uh, so it was gradually increased and now they're all phased out. I said that adopting new regulations is a very lengthy process. The exemption is this. Uh, after the terrorist attacks uh, in New York uh, um, in 2001, uh, a new regulation fo sorry, focusing on uh, preventing terrorism was uh, implemented uh, uh, and it's called the ISPS code. Uh, this happened very fast and was uh, included in uh, uh, regulations in just a couple of years. Okay, 
I think we've seen statistics which is newer than this on the flag states. Let's uh, rather focus on the port state control regime. Um, the port states, um, the nations of the major ports, they now typically cooperate uh, and exchange information on uh, the quality of vessels. In Europe, this is called the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, and they propose or, or publish a blacklist of uh, vessels that uh, are not um, according to the quality criteria they have established. They present a blacklist of flags which are uh, doing uh, or should have extra attention. So they have published a list of very high risk flags and high risk, medium and so on. Based on statistics on the ex uh, inspections that they do. Um, some flags seem to be uh, flag states not, uh, does seem to have problems enforcing regulations. Um, this has triggered increased port state control regimes and uh, um, the ports then check the status of their certification of the ships and do physical inspections and uh, check if they comply with all conventions. If they find that the specific vessel doesn't meet the quality or criteria, uh, they may detain, hold back the vessel and say that you're not able to sail on until you fix this. And they also report this incident to all the other ports of, of uh, the region. Um, a detention may be very costly to the ship owner, uh, so this uh, is a very effective way of controlling it. In Europe, I said, there's a Paris Memorandum of Understanding guiding this. In Asia, you have similar things and for Latin America and most of parts of the world. The, within these regimes, they exchange ship information, uh, checklists, and they agree upon the same sort of targeting criteria for vessels. In Europe, a database called the Quasis is uh, established on uh, ship inspections like this. And this is some of the statistics from, uh, from the European case. You can see that um, the number of detentions has generally declined, meaning that the quality of the vessels has improved over these years. Um, yeah. And it looks even uh, more impressive if you look at it in percent of inspections because you have sort of increased the number of uh, inspections as well. This um, uh, Equasis database is open to anyone, also to you, so you can look up uh, vessels if you uh, like here. Here is one concrete example. You can see that this is under the Paris Memorandum of Understanding. Um, and uh, one specific vessel is reported there. Uh, here is a very concrete uh, example of uh, a Norwegian vessel called Trimnes, which is actually used uh, locally for bulk transports uh, along the Norwegian coast. Here are the number of inspections that uh, this vessel has been through, all in Europe. So it says Paris Memorandum of Understanding. Um, in one case, here for instance, in uh, September 2012, it was inspected in a Polish port and they found three deficiencies, three things that were not according to the quality criteria. And here is the listing of that. It was something with the lifeboats, something with the maintenance and inspection regime and the fire system. Now this kind of uh, this is the kind of transparency that you can have. Anyone can go into this and check if this vessel is uh, actually of a high quality. Here you can see if, the, if they have serious deficiencies, they will not be able to sail on and they will have a detention. In this case of this vessel, it doesn't have any detentions, meaning that it doesn't have any, hasn't had any uh, significant um, quality problems. There is one. Yeah, there is one. Yeah, that's true. 
uh, in Germany, yeah, for one day. So they were probably able to fix it within a day. But it had 12 remarks there, yeah. Okay. Classification societies I mentioned, uh, Norske Veritas is, uh, is one of them, Germanische Lloyd is another one. Uh, this is a list of detention ratios, how often the vessels of a specific classification society is detained, says so something about the qualities. You can find uh, the Norske Veritas here, Germanische Lloyd down here, very few detentions, whereas you have some other uh, classification societies with a high uh, detention ratio. This is a, just a general picture of, of the casualty history, how many ships have been lost at sea, and you can see that uh, this is a, a falling curve with time, which uh, could be seen as an indication that the quality assurance regime is actually working and reducing substandard shipping. The major four actors of the safety regime is the flag states, the classification, the ship owner and the port state. And uh, the, to sum up this bit, the present system, there seems to be a demand for higher safety still, as an increasing political pressure for this as well. Uh, this means that the scope of regulations, there are more and more regulations coming on. Most of them are triggered by some sort of a, an accident or, or things that have happened. Um, to some extent we might see regional solutions if, um, if the, it's difficult to uh, have agreements about the global ones. So maybe there is not a lack of regulations but lack of compliance problem now. Summing up, we need the global regulations to uh, cope with the international shipping market, to make it difficult to evade and, uh, regulations and to make it cost efficient. The major areas of shipping policies, policies is related to safety and security or environmental issues. The port state control regime has become more important. Uh, and has proven effectiveness when it comes to fight substandard shipping. There are new regulations which are stricter when it comes to emissions to air, which uh, are coming now, and uh, this is a big challenge, especially for short sea shipping in, in those areas. Many remaining issues, uh, maybe CO2 regulations is the most important bit. That's it for today. Um, we will come back to the maritime sector in, in a few days, uh, but with other um, issues to be addressed uh, in the next lecture first. Um, as I said, those of you who want to have feedback on, on propositions for, for the uh, essay, uh, just send me an email or to Svein, my colleague. Uh, and we can give you some more thorough feedback or perhaps even tip you on sources of information if you need that. Thank you. <laughs>